so the same as Marcello, I will present an observation, but not with masters, with another technique using those polarizations. So this is a work that we submitted, so normally it should be online in the report well, soon. So the sample, not to, so, to keep it uh, simple, we use CRL 618 and OH 231.8 by the Calabash Nivelle. So we divided our sample with one carbon rich and one oxygen rich um, object. One is slightly, CRL 618 is slightly or, uh, younger than, uh, than the Calabash Nivelle. So how are we going to do this? So we're going to use the continuum emission polarization mapping. Basically, we're going, we're going to observe the dust and spinning dust. But when you have a magnetic field and you put in and you have paramagnetic dust grain, well, non-spherical, because they have to be non-spherical, non-spherical spinning paramagnetic dust grain, with time they will align with the long axis perpendicular to the magnetic field. So if you want a map of the magnetic fields, what you do is that you rotate the vector, the polarization vector by 90 degrees. This time we use the millimeter array in parametric mode. The last time we did that observation, we used single dish. So this time we're going to have a better resolution. So the nominal resolution is 2.5 and 7 at 345 MHz. The compact configuration that we use allows us to have a maximum baseline of 7, uh, around 70 meter. And the lower sideband and USB band cover a range from 313 to 346 GHz. So, the results. In terms of continuum, this is the, the contours of the representative continuum that we found for CRS 8. Sorry. So, we found a peak intensity of 3.4 GHz per beam and a mean intensity of the whole, um, the whole area. 1.2 gens per beam. So what about the polarization? Okay, so on the left you have the polarization. So this is the direction of the dust. So what you can see is that all our vectors are well aligned, well constrained in one direction and this direction is the equator of our object. So the, we detect the linear polarization above 3 sigma, so to be so to have peak at 4.4 sigma. This object has a really low polarization, uh, around 1%. The mean polarization under here is at 90 degrees, 96 degrees. So if you rotate your polarization vector, you have the direction of the magnetic field. And this magnetic field is aligned with the outflow. The blue and red arrows will show you the CO outflow, the 12 CO outflow, the two, two transition. But I will go back to that a bit later. So, in this case, in the case of CRS 618, what you can see is that you have a well defined and well organized polar magnetic field. In the case of OH231, here is the continuum very close to the interior of the nebula. We had a peak intensity of 0.76 GHz per beam, so much lower than the other objects, with an intensity of 0.31. Now, this object was really interesting because, in fact, what we detected is that you have four polarized areas. Those areas are, um, have been detected also above three sigmas with a peak of four sigma. Each blob contains polarization vector, which are within, well, within each blob. They are well aligned, they are well constrained, they have a principal direction. Here, in that direction, this here. So the percentage of polarization in this object is much higher than in CRS 618, and we reach a peak of 15.6%. Over the world polarized, polarized area, the mean is 4.3%. So if you rotate those vectors by 90 degrees to have your magnetic map, what you have is a nice X-shaped distribution. And that X-shaped distribution is generally associated with a dipole a dipole configuration. But we have a set of vectors, those grain here and here, that might belong to a toroidal configuration, like the reciprocal uh, toroidal configuration. So the same as CR618, in the Calabash Nebulae, what you have is a well-defined and well-organized dipole or toroidal, because in that direction you have the outflow, a well-defined and well-organized dipole or toroidal magnetic field. 
So during this conference, we talked a lot about uh, launching mechanisms. What could be, what could launch all those objects? So I propose, of course, a magnetic launching mechanism. So in the case of Sierra 618, if this time I compare the direction of the magnetic field with the outflow, those are the blue shifted, <coughs> the, the, the blue shifted, the red shifted CO outflows. It's a transition. I mean, uh, the transition, the 12 CO, the 3 to transition. So what you can see, put it back to that. So here your um, your vector are well constrained near the central star. Okay. In the case of OH231, those are your outflow, blue shifted, red shifted, CO molecular outflow. And what you have is that your vector, your magnetic vector, perfectly encompass the wall of those outflow. This is well seen, for example, in the blue shifted outflow, also in the red shifted one. You still have those vectors here, which are a bit lower from the central part of the, of the nebulae, and that can be ground up like in a sort of toroidal, toroidal field. So we have a good alignment of the magnetic field vector with the CO outflow in both of uh, both protoplanetary nebulae, although OH3 on might be a symbiotic. We have a type this those maps, what they told us, that you have the dynamical polar field, a small scale, small scale. That means that we're going closer to the central star. So that might indicate an outflow launching. But the problem here, particularly in that case, is the question is who is dragging who? Is that the magnetic field are really collimating and get the, the force, the strength to collimate the outflow, or the magnetic lines are dragged with the outflow. If you remember the talk by Eric Blackman yesterday, and we compared the um, two types of magnetic launching. You have the magnetic tower and you have the magnetocentrifugal force, magnetocentrifugal launch. This configuration would be more likely to be a magnetocentrifugal launch. Okay? So in that case, the, we will need to have a strength there's a strength issue, an intensity issue. We need to know who is dominant. And with the data that we have actually is still clear. So I will go to my main finding and the conclusion. So we have in both objects we detect a well organized and colloidal or equal magnetic field. In the case of OH231, we have the nice X shape distribution of the magnetic field. The percentage of polarization is higher in orange than the Serge object. This is something that we've seen before when we were studying other type of, um, of objects. And what we can say is that we have a chemistry, but well, percentage polarization is chemistry dependent, depending on the nature and the type of the grain. In the oxygen rich object, for example, if you have the big grain, they are big enough to contain inclusion, and those inclusion can be super paramagnetic, the strain, iron or magnetic. And if you have that, the, your percentage of polarization will be, of course, higher. And of, the most important is that the efficiency of the alignment will be higher. With all data, we were able to have the, all the molecular data, but unfortunately, we didn't find any detection in the um, polarization of the molecular line above the sigma. This is the goal which, using the goal which that is effect. So this is something that we expect to do. Um, well, in the future, we can repeat that at, uh, with other CO lines. The last, but not the least, it seems that we have an evolutionary pattern in terms of the configuration of the magnetic field. So, if I summarize the work that we've done in 2007, where we study um, CR2688, NGC 7027, NGC 6537, NGC 6302. So we had one protoplanetary nebulae, three planetary nebulae. We find that there was a, there was a change in the configuration of the magnetic field. Okay, so let's pay attention to that. Okay, so all those 
object we have, which are the younger ones, those are the protoplanetary nebulae, they tend to show polar or polar configuration. CR 26888 and maybe OH31 show a dual configuration, both a torido and a dipole. And all our planetary nebulae only show a torido magnetic field. So you have so you have a change of configuration while the nebula is the nebulae are evolving. So the two hypotheses are the following. Either we have a single configuration we have at the beginning. Let's say at the, at the protoplanetary phase, you have a polar um, configuration. With time, including, including a rotation, you have a transition to a rotate to a toroidal configuration. Or we have a, at the beginning, we have a coexisting configuration. We just not only have a polaroidal field, we have a polaroidal and a toroidal field. But at that time, the polaroidal field dominates. But as a polaroidal field declines much quicker, much quickly than a toroidal field, the polaroidal field, the polaroidal configuration declines one over r squared, while the toroidal one declines one over r. So what you have naturally in the end is the um, the domination of a toroidal configuration when you reach the planetary nuclear phase. <coughs> so what we're going to do next? So we will need, of course, more detailed parametric observation. That means going even deeper, closer to the central star. That can be done now with HALMA because you have a polarization model for the continuum, for example, where we will get the gain depth of, and also we get speed. Again, we'll be able to have much more observation in short time. Uh, this is also really interesting if we want to test this outflow launching, mechanism of outflow launching. We also need, yeah, this is really important, an accurate measurement of the magnetic strength. We don't have, of course, Marcelo showed you that we can do it with lasers, but we will need also at some point to detect them in the central star of, the, of those objects. So there's a poster, B30 by Egil Toad, I don't know if I make it correctly, where they detect the magnetic fields in NGC 1514. So we need more of that, you know, because with the laser, what you do, you extrapolate what it could be, what the field can be on the central star. So we have the, we have the shape, we have a distribution of the field, we need the intensity of the field, and then we will be able to have some good modeling and so inside what can be, what is the action of magnetic fields in evolved stars. And that's it. Time for a question and a half. Well, I, I think it's a little bit premature to come say or conclude on the basis of two objects reducing a difference in the strength of the fields that has to do with the chemistry. Especially oh, the strength of the field. But well, we don't have any strength of the field. No, you said that in, in, in your summary you said that earlier that you're seeing a difference in this in the polarization. Yeah, presentation of polarization. Between yeah. and you think that, that may be related to chemistry. Yes. But of course, in 618, you have to worry about the fact that there's ionization. There's an ionized core in the same region, and that will cause some, that will affect your polarization measurements. Well, in the case of those, the carbon rich are more concerned than the fact that they are full of, well, carbon rich are generally have smaller grains, so it's natural that you would expect smaller polarization. No, all I'm saying is yeah. we should be careful. Yeah. I mean, we just have a very small sample. Yeah, we have a small, of course, we have a small sample. Once we will have a lot of them, then we will have a nice mass and we will be able to see. Do you want to hold your question? Wait, we'll have to hold your question until discussion. We have to move along, I'm sorry. Okay. So we're going to move along to the second talk by Albert Zuska. They let him talk twice, this scientific organizing committee. But this talk is on bipolar planetary nebulae in the galactic bulge. <laughs> 